unmuted. Hello everyone, this is Chao Orhano speaking on behalf of the UP Med Class 91 webinar team. This is an initiative of the University of the Philippines Medical Alumni Society. The UP Med webinar series is held every first and last Wednesdays of the month from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Manila time. It delves on important current and emerging medical topics and is targeted for physicians, especially general practitioners, occupational and industrial health MDs, primary care physicians, family and community medicine physicians, and other health workers. Registration is free. This webinar runs on GoToWebinar. If you're encountering problems as you participate, please log out from the session and then join the meeting room using the link sent earlier to your emails or by entering the webinar ID 507-183-819. Due to erratic internet connectivity depending on your area, you may get disconnected during the webinar. If this happens, please restart your session. If you cannot rejoin the meeting room, kindly stream the session at livestream.upm.edu.ph and text your questions to 0915-905-0918. When we remind attendees that first, your mic should be mute for the rest of the meeting. Second, use the chat box mainly for your questions and comments. All questions on the topic should be addressed to our moderator, Dr. Mary Ann Castor. The, sh the session will run for an hour with 30 Two minutes allotted for a lecture, followed by a reaction and a question and answer portion. We will now call on our moderator, Dr. Kastor. Thank you, Therese. Our time now in Manila is 12.02 in the afternoon. And I'm speaking to you from the video conferencing room of the UP Manila, Padre Paula Street, Ermita, Manila. Welcome to our participants. Today's topic is Dengue Awareness and Prevention. The objectives of today's seminar are to present the epidemiology of dengue, to briefly review the clinical presentation, and to discuss the prevention and control of dengue. Today's speaker is Dr. Salvacion Rodriguez Gachalian. Dr. Gachalian is a, finished her medicine course at the UP College of Medicine, finished her residency in pediatrics at UPPGH, and her fellowship in infectious disease at the joint program of the UPPJH and the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. At present, she is an associate professor of the UP College of Medicine, a consultant of the section of infectious and tropical disease department of pediatrics, UP College of Medicine, Philippine General Hospital. She's also a consultant of the Research mm -hmm. Institute for Tropical Medicine. She is currently the Vice President and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Philippine Pediatric Society, the immediate past President of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines, President of the International Society of Tropical Pediatrics, Philippine Chapter, and the Deputy Executive Director of the Philippine Foundation for Vaccination. She is also a member of the PILCAP. Without further ado, may we now welcome Dr. Sally Gachalian. Thank you, Mian, for the very kind introduction. Um, my topic is on disease, dengue disease awareness and prevention. Dengue is an arboviral disease that poses a significant public health burden in most tropical and subtropical countries. In the Philippines, it continues to be a leading cause of morbidity in fact, it still ranks ninth amongst the 10 leading causes of morbidity, and that majority of cases are seen in the age group 5 to 14 years. Globally, there's been a 30-fold increase in the of dengue for the last 50 years. There are about 319 million people that are estimated to have dengue infections every year, and that 96 million are estimated to have apparent dengue infections. There is a quadrupling as well of the number of countries reporting severe dengue since 1970. It is estimated that about 500,000 people actually develop severe dengue, which require hospitalization annually. In the Philippines, we were the first to have dengue hemorrhagic fever, and this was identified in Manila during the times of 1953, 54, and 56. 
outbreaks. And subsequently, outbreaks were observed in the 1960s and subsequently at five-year intervals. In Southeast Asia, the burden of dengue is actually higher than your upper respiratory tract infections and even hepatitis B. As far as the incidence of dengue is, compare, is concerned, we have seen that for this year, there was a 14% higher increase of dengue compared to the same time period of last year. For 2015, there were about 110,000 over cases. And in 2016, at that same time period, there were about 126,386 suspect dengue cases that were actually reported. And majority of the cases were in the following regions. You see that the majority now is seen in Region 6, accounting for about 12.7%. In Region 4, about 10.4%. Region 7, 10.3%. And Region 12, 8.3%. In region 3, 8.9%. Last year, actually, the three main regions that had the highest number of dengue cases were regions 3, which still continues, and 4A, but we had high cases of dengue as well in the national capital region. However, this year, at this same time, at this same time period, we've seen lowering of dengue cases compared to that of last year in the national capital region majority or accounting for more than 50% of the cases were males and that most of this actually belonged to the age group 5 to 14 years of age. The four types of dengue are actually circulating in the country and that the highest burden of dengue were due to serotypes 1 and 3 over the past seven years. Dengue is, we know, the most rapidly spreading mosquito-borne viral disease in the world. And it belongs to the genus Flavivirus and the family Flaviviridae, which is similar to that of Zika, of the Japanese encephalitis vaccine, and even the West Nile encephalitis. And I think, as everybody knows, the vector, uh, vector mosquito is actually your Aedes aegypti, and is mainly found in tropical and subtropical regions. Dengue is one viral disease that actually affects people of all ages and continues to be a leading cause of illness and death in both tropical and subtropical countries. Now let us meet the enemy, our mosquito vector. That's Aedes aegypti and of course sometimes Aedes albopictus as well may be a vector mosquito. These two mosquitoes are what we refer to as the uh, tiger-like because they have strapped uh, white banded legs and as far as Aedes aegypti is concerned, it actually prefers taking blood meals from humans and to a lesser degree, domestic mammals, which actually makes it a very capable vector for the dengue viruses. And it is the main dengue vector worldwide. Aedes uh, albopictus, on the other hand, has the same uh, physical characteristics as your Aedes aegypti. It is mostly an outdoor mosquito. It bites humans, but also a wide variety of other domestic and wild vertebrates that actually do not carry the dengue virus, which makes it a lesser uh, vector than that of um, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. So it lowers its capacity to transmit the virus. The Aedes uh, aegypti mosquito, or even the albopictus, metamorphosis is completed within about 10 to 12 days, starting from the eggs, and then it becomes a larvae. And you know that the larvae, these are the fast swimmers, and can stay for prolonged periods in the water. The larvae then becomes the pupa. The pupa is usually uh, the more stable, does not swim unless it is disturbed, and then it becomes an adult mosquito. So what are the characteristics of the Aedes aegypti mosquito or the albopictus? Most people are asking, what are the characteristics of this mosquito? Well, these mosquitoes are actually drawn to warm skin and they are drawn to victims who actually move a lot. That's why maybe majority of the cases are actually in children. And that humans are usually beaten on the back or the side of the body. They are also able to travel 50 to 300 meters from their breeding area. The mosquito is more during the rainy season, 
and their lifespan is about 30 to 20, uh, to 30 days, 20 to 30 days. And they can lay their eggs after a blood meal. They usually live in dark places and lay their eggs in clear water. After the pupa stage, as we have seen earlier, the mosquito becomes a mature adult mosquito. And that the male and female mosquito may actually start breeding and mating after 24 hours of becoming an adult mosquito. Mm -hmm. The female will actually lay eggs within 72 hours or three days, and they can lay as much as 60 to 100 lay, uh, eggs. Only the female Aedes mosquito can actually bite and transfer the dengue virus. Now, the mosquito can also harbor multiple serotypes so that simultaneous transmission may occur during a bite. However, there is no conclusive data really to support this. And that most individuals may be co-infected as well with one serotype, more than one serotype. However, we do not know if this co-infection may actually increase or may lead to a more severe disease because currently there's still no data as well. The um, transmission or the infection with dengue, rather, can also have co-infection with other viruses like your Zika and chikungunya because they have the same vector mosquito. However, the number of reported co-infections is actually very limited. Now, this co-infection with Zika or chikungunya, the possibility that, is, that it causing severity of the illness may actually be increased, but again, there is no data to document this. Now let's look at the clinical manifestations. Uh, let's look at dengue first because this can have similar manifestations such as Zika and chikungunya. The incubation period is quite short. It can be as short as three days to 14 days after a bite of mosquito. There's an average of about four to seven days. Usually they present with a sudden onset of fever. They can have rashes. Severe headache and retroorbital pain are very common complaints of children and adolescents. What about Zika? It would have more or less the same incubation period. But what's characteristic of Zika is that they usually present with maculopapular rash that appears in the first days of the symptoms. It appears from face down to the body. And they usually have non-purulent conjunctivitis and, and or conjunctival hyperemia. Chikungunya, on the other hand, also would have the similar sort of incubation period, 2 to 12 days, and they have an abrupt onset of fever. Zika is usually low-grade fever. And what is significant with chikungunya is that, a part, uh, that is not similar to that of Zika and dengue, would be the fact that patients with chikungunya will present with severe arthralgia, usually presenting on the hands, the feet, the ankles, and wrists. The clinical manifestations of dengue actually results in a spectrum of disease. So there are three phases. One is the febrile phase, and then you have the critical phase, and the recovery phase. During the febrile phase, patient presents with high fever, and this is a time where you have very high viremia, and of course there's always the potential that the patient may have dehydration. This is then followed by your critical phase, usually occurring from the three to the seventh day of illness. The fever subsides, this is when there is defervescence, and during this time there would be increase in your immunoglobulin M and G, there would be a decrease in your platelet count, and the hematocrit will actually peak. In severe dengue cases, there will be plasma leakage leading to shock. There could be pleural effusion, there could be ascites. There can, in fact, be severe hemorrhage and organ impairment. During the recovery phase, the hematocrit normalizes. At this time, you will see higher IgM and IgG, and the platelet count will normalize as well. Generally, when your white cell count, when there's leukopenia in the beginning, and your white cell count starts to go up, you will know that in two to three days, the plate that will actually follow. And for severe dengue cases, during the recovery phase, there is reabsorption of the fluids and hypervolemia. The World Health Organization is actually providing two sets of guidelines for classification of dengue disease. We have the 1997 WHO classification and the 2009 WHO classification. The 2009 WHO classification, which we're actually using now in practice, are your dengue without warning signs and dengue with warning signs. Dengue without warning signs would include fever and any two of the following, nausea or vomiting, rash, 
aches and pains, a tourniquet test that's positive, and leukopenia. So there's low white cell count. It's usually less than 5,000. Patients who have warning signs are those patients presenting with abdominal pain or even abdominal tenderness. There's persistent vomiting. There's fluid accumulation. They can have ascites. They can have pleural effusion. They can have mucosal bleeding. There's lethargy or restlessness. And the liver may be enlarged. The hematocrit will be increasing. And the platelet count will be decreased. There are diagnostic tests that are available when you try to assess cases who are suspected to have dengue. And these are, during your viremia period, the most sensitive would be your uh, RT-PCR assay, and then of course you have your NS1. The IgM-IgG is more significantly seen, or there's an increase that is seen during the fourth to the fifth to the sixth day, up to the tenth day of illness. This will show us a more graphic presentation probably easier to understand because during the viremia during the period of viremia this is when there's a lot of the virus in the blood the most sensitive test that one can do is of course virus isolation which is kind of difficult because you have to wait for two weeks and then there's the mosquito inoculation generally we don't do this there's mosquito culture as well and then you can use your molecular techniques like your polymerase chain reaction and of course the NS1 antigen detection which a lot of people are actually using now and then, during the period from the, after the fourth day to the 16th day, there will be increase if your uh, IgM, IgG antibodies. So you can do hemagglutination inhibition tests. You can have your plaque reduction neutralization test and your ELISA IgM, IgG. And of course, other rapid tests as well, like gut blood, immunoblot, dipstick, and immunochromatography. Up to now, there's still no dengue-specific antiviral treatment that is available. Generally, management will include treating the fever using acetaminophen or paracetamol, and of course, giving hydration, oral or intravenous, uh, intravenous fluid management. And what's very important is the monitoring of patients, particularly during the critical phase, during the period when the patient becomes a febrile. This is very important because this is the time when you will detect uh, severe dengue, detect bleeding early, and of course, institute appropriate effective management for severe dengue. Patients with severe dengue will need to be admitted to hospital, maybe even to intensive care, and then they should be managed with fluid uh, volume. Antiviral treatments are still being investigated, so this is still not available. Now, reducing the risk of uh, transmission would include vector control and, of course, individual and household protection. Vector control will include, or this will decrease transmission of the virus through the use or combination of three methods, including environmental management, chemical control, and biological control. Of course, individual household protection would mean, you know, clothing, using long sleeves, decreasing exposure of body surfaces, use of repellents. These are individual household protection that we can actually do. I'm sure everyone is aware of the uh, Department of Health head advi health advisory on dengue. They call this the four S, laban sa dengue. First is search and destroy. This is, of course, cleaning the environment. And then you have the self-protection measures. These are, of course, the use of clothing, repellents, mosquito nets, etc. And then seek early consultation. Patients, especially during the rainy season, who present with fever of two days or more should already seek consult. And then, of course, to say no to indiscriminate fogging. Fogging is usually done only during outbreaks. Now, when we say vector control, remember there will be three. So environmental management, this is actually the mainstay of dengue vector control. This means changing the environment to be able to prevent or minimize vector propagation. This would include environmental modification. This is a long-lasting physical transformation to be able to reduce the larval habitats. Examples of this would be, of course, installing a piped water system to communities and, of course, most especially to household connections. And then we have environmental manipulation. These are temporary changes to the habitats of the vector. Examples will be, of course, the regular emptying and cleaning and scrubbing of water storage vessels, flower vases, 
recycling or proper disposal of the discarded containers and tires, covering water that is stored in earthen jars, etc. So these are some of the examples that we can do for environmental manipulation. And then we have changes to human habitation or behavior. This will reduce human to vector contact. Like we said, this would include installing mosquito nets, screen, using body uh, clothing, long sleeves, so that you decrease exposure of the body surfaces, and of course, mosquito nets while sleeping during the daytime. Because as we know, the Aedes aegypti mosquito responsible for transmitting the dengue virus is a day biting mosquito. And then we have chemical control. This would include the use of larvicides and adulticides. For spraying, this is usually done on areas where people congregate, those with high like schools, hospitals, or communities where dengue cases have already been reported or where the vectors are actually abundant. So spray is used only in cases where you have identified dengue when there is an outbreak, but not as routine spraying every month. And then you have biological control. These are, this means introduction of organisms that actually prey, parasitize, compete with, or otherwise reduce the population of target species, such as your larvae. They are, for example, you have the fish, larvivorous fish, and then I think this is like the guppy fish that you see, the, the small fishes that are usually seen in the uh, aquarium. And then, of course, you have your copepods. The thing with copepods is that they are effective only against the immature stages of the vector mosquito. And then you have the fish species. This is used to eliminate the mosquitoes from larger containers. That's why, for example, ponds or, you know, like in houses or even in schools, it is preferable that they will have fishes as well because then this fish will actually eat the larvae. And then you have, again, like we said, the predatory copepods. They survive for long periods of time. The thing is you need to reintroduce them for sustained control. So we know that vector control is critical in reducing the spread of dengue, but it has not been fully successful as what we would have wanted it to be. We know that vector control aims to reduce transmission, the number of infections, and of course to prevent outbreaks of the disease. But until now, the only way to reduce or prevent dengue virus transmission that we have is through vector control. The implementation of vector control in endemic countries is usually insufficient and even ineffective. That's why dengue continues to spread. And epidemic dengue outbreaks actually still occur. Therefore, an integrated strategy of ongoing vector control and probably vaccination is required. The World Health Organization, the organization believes that the development of an effective dengue vaccine is a priority as a supplement, as one of the elements to be able to reduce the burden of dengue. Now, there are actually several dengue vaccine candidates that are in clinical development. These vaccines have used different technologies. There can be live attenuated vaccines, there can be recombinant vaccines, there can be inactivated vaccines, or subunit vaccines, there can be vaccines using adjuvants, or a combination of any of these technologies. So far, we can see that it is the Sanofi Pasteur vaccine that has actually been licensed among all of these vaccines in clinical development. Now, the SAGE recommends that countries should consider the introduction of the vaccine only in geographic settings with high endemicity. They recommend that zero prevalence of at least 70% or greater in the age group that is targeted for vaccination may have a national program. Or, because it is difficult to have zero prevalence data, they state as well that other suitable epidemiologic markers that has been collected through surveillance could in fact be a substitute for zero prevalence. What are these uh, suitable epidemiologic markers? They could be the disease incidence in the country, the sustained transmission of the virus, whether all four serotypes are actually circulating, whether the cases are domestic or imported, and whether the cases are actually appearing or occurring all throughout the year.
The vaccine, however, is not recommended as stated by SAGE, which is the strategic advisory group of experts, when the seroprevalence is below 50% in the targeted age groups. This means that the vaccine is not recommended as a national program if seroprevalence is 50% or lower. They also state that decisions about introducing the vaccine as a national program will require careful assessment at the country level. You look at local priorities, you look at the epidemiology, the affordability, the impact of the budget, and cost effectiveness. And that dengue vaccination should be a part of a comprehensive dengue control program strategy. This does not mean that the dengue is the cure for all. They should all be grouped together. That's why it's an integrated strategy. Now, the World Health Organization came out with a position paper as well in July 29 of 2016. And in that position paper, they stated that each country should define their own target age for routine vaccination. And that routine vaccination of populations up to 45 years of age may only be considered in countries if the incidence of dengue is high in the adults. And actually, the WHO position paper, as well as SAGE, they're very permissive as far as concomitant administration of other vaccines are concerned. They say that other live and non-live vaccines can be co-administered with the dengue vaccine in order to reduce programmatic costs associated with school-based immunization programs. Now, there's only one dengue vaccine that is available and commercially available in the country today. This is a tetravalent recombinant live attenuated vaccine that uses a recombinant technology wherein it uses yellow fever live attenuated vaccine strain as its backbone in the construction of the dengue virus genomes that are included in the vaccine. These vaccines are there combined into a single preparation. It is freeze-dried and does not contain adjuvant or preservatives. The recombinant technology was actually chosen because of the proven success that they've seen with the Japanese encephalitis vaccine. And in addition, benefits attributed to the vaccine, including genetic stability, robust response, and safety were all very appealing. So the vaccine has shown consistent efficacy profile among subjects 9 to 16 years of age during two large efficacy trials conducted in Asia involving five countries, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and Vietnam, and in Latin America. The 9 to 16 years of age indication, um, the nine-year-old indication for the vaccine was determined via a post hoc analysis. So the vaccine shows that it will will reduce symptomatic dengue in about 65.6%. It will reduce hospitalization in 8 out of 10 patients and it will reduce severe dengue in 9 out of 10 patients who actually develop dengue. So, because the World Health Organization recognizes the high burden of dengue in both tropical and subtropical countries, they have set objectives in order to reduce the burden of dengue. And the WHO objectives include one, reducing mortality by more than 50% by 2020, morbidity by more than 25% by 2020, and to estimate the true burden of the disease by 2015. However, this set of objectives hasn't actually been satisfied so far. These objectives actually include five technical elements. Early diagnosis and appropriate case management. Of course, an integrated surveillance and outbreak preparedness. This will include community projects, community education, and then of course, a sustainable vector control program, vaccination or vaccine implementation. So it's only one of the five elements that will help reduce the burden of dengue. And then of course, basic operational and implement, uh, implementational research. Now, of course, vaccination could be one of the critical pillars to effectively fight the dengue virus. And so with this, uh, I believe that we're all aware what dengue is, and we all realize that dengue continues to be a public health problem in the Philippines, and that a lot of our patients, you know, it's actually the perception. When you say dengue, patients are afraid. Patients will ask, will I die or will I not die? 
So I think what's important is to be able to diagnose dengue early and of course institute appropriate management as soon as possible. And then of course look at the other uh, elements, surveillance, vector control, research, and of course vaccination. Thank you very much. Thank you for that insightful lecture, Dr. Gracelian. We have currently logged into the GoWebinars, GoToWebinar site, ADE, and the fourth free live stream. We would like to thank today's sponsor, Sanofi Pasteur, our media partners, the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and the Filipino Doctor. Before we proceed to our Q&A portion, let's have one of our panelists give her reactions. Then, introduce our reactor, Dr. Nina Pascua Berba. Dr. Berba is a Philippine Science High School scholar and graduated magna cum laude in BS Biology at UP Diliman. She finished her medical school at the UP College of Medicine and did a straight internship in internal medicine. She had a residency in internal medicine at the PGH, took her fellowship in infectious disease at the Medical College of Pennsylvania in the USA, and she did her master's in clinical epidemiology at the UP College of Medicine. At present, she is a clinical associate professor at the UPCM and a medical specialist three at the PGH. She heads the infectious disease section of the Department of Medicine in PGH and chairs the hospital infection control, infection control and is, is the executive director of the UP Prime TB box. At the Medical City, she is the director of the iReact HIV AIDS Clinic. On top of that, she is also a principal investigator in numerous clinical trials, research studies, and research projects for government institutions, as well as international collaborations involving health policies and guidelines. So we may now call on Dr. Nina Barba. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for your invitation to uh, give a reaction to this uh, very good and insightful uh, presentation of Dr. Sally. Uh, certainly, she walked us through the full spectrum of uh, dengue infection, how to initially diagnose and manage and later on walk us through the prevention and control aspects which are all equally important in the overall care of patients with um, them. I would just put in some practical points about dengue to add on to her already very exhaustive uh, presentation of dengue. Um, it might interest you to know that uh, the layman's term for dengue fever is really great ball fever. So many of our patients would say that this is really the most painful experience for them. And this is probably why in the 18th century, Dr. Benjamin Rush called it the great ball fever. So for our, for those who already experienced uh, dengue in the past, you would remember that you came down with very high fevers Masakit talaga yung katawan. This is what patients would tell us. Ito yung pinakamasakit na katawan sa buong buhay nila. And that's probably why it's called great bone fever. It might interest you to know also that uh, the first, very first reports of severe disease before called the dengue hemorrhagic fevers were actually documented in the Philippines, in the city of Manila, in 1953. So this is a landmark event during that time. And around this period now, in the 20, 13, 14, 15, and today, we are again in the midst of uh, events related to dengue. And this is related to the availability of vaccines now. Our country will always be at risk for dengue. We belong to that strip in the world, in the tropical zone, that have been identified to be uh, areas where uh, countries within that area will always be at risk for dengue. 
We also belong to the 30 most highly endemic countries based on the WHO classifications. Um, many patients would, when they present with fever and a possibility of dengue diagnosis, will ask, Doc, kailan ba nag kailan ba ako nakagat ng lamang? So, uh, the incubation period is usually around three to seven days. And uh, it's good for patients to look back at where they probably had the mosquito virus so that they are able at their level to be able to have some control and prevention within their family or household. So the incubation is around three to seven days and then dengue will work like clockwork. So they will start off with very high fevers, acute febrile phase they call it and usually this will last for about five days. Uh, more often than not, it will finish by the fifth day. And if your patients are, if patients come in with febrile illness and the duration is beyond this, the five to seven days, then you start thinking that this might not be dengue anymore. And then they proceed on to the febrile phase is manifested with like what Dr. Gachalian said, an out of uh, symptoms that may make patients come to the physician, whether in the uh, this is when they feel very, very ill and a uh, lot of muscle pains, joint pains, and microorbital pains. There might be some vomiting and some diarrhea for some patients. And then after the fifth day, usually they may uh, overlap to a critical phase wherein if warning signs will occur, then uh, they will happen. Usually the warning signs will be some abdominal pains, tenderness, restlessness, and some changes in the laboratory tests. Most patients will overcome this critical phase and they will be for guests and then later on proceed to recovery phase. Uh, we tell the patients during the recovery phase that uh, uh, it may actually take several days up to like seven days uh, or a week from the time the fever goes away for them to go back to their usual state of health. So sometimes you have to explain this to patients because uh, they feel that as soon as the fever goes away they're actually very okay already but they will continue to feel some degree of weakness and maybe the poor appetite will persist. Um, in adults, most of the time they recover rather um, without undue complications. But through the years of dealing with dengue infections, we've seen very atypical presentations. So uh, even in literature, there are co-infections, we call them. So that's we've seen dengue and acute appendicitis happening together or dengue looking like acute appendicitis to the point that uh, patients may actually have to undergo uh, explore laparotomy uh, and ending up with that acute appendicitis. So they may mimic acute appendicitis. We've also seen very complex types of dengue infections where sepsis from bacteremic infections occur. And um, usually these are cases that where the prognosis or the outcomes may not be very, very possible. So many patients may actually uh, end up as mortalities related to the uh, co-infections with the bacteria. And of course, we've also seen dengue happening with typhoid fever and dengue happening with malaria. Why does this have complications or complex manifestations of dengue occur? It's probably related to the human host response plus the virus factors which lead to a lot of uh, inflammatory responses that leads to abnormal bleeding and plasma leakage. Uh, there's a lot of proposed models for pathogenesis of dengue fever and all of these end up as what many authors would say cytokines form, the kakagulo sa loob ng patient and leading to a very disturbing mix of events that lead to a lot of inflammation cascading to very complex manifestations of things. 
Uh, I'd like to just uh, also comment on the laboratory diagnosis of dengue fever. And there's like a pattern we try to follow. So in the first few days, particularly in the first four days, we think the virus is still there. So you can actually document the presence of virus in the blood. That's when it's best to do the dengue NS1 test. When patients come to physicians uh, during the first three to four days of um, fever, it's not usually cost-effective to do all the tests. We're trying to be as cost-effective here as possible. So um, uh, viral testing like uh, RT-PCR or NS1, daily NS1, would be most suitable during this phase. And when patients come, because sometimes patients will come when the fever persists for like beyond four to five days, that's when you get your antibody levels, particularly like the IgG. Uh, I'd like to also, at this point, uh, say that uh, the University of the Philippines actually invested on a new test called the Valvotec, which is based on a lab technology. This is uh, this promises to be a new armamentarium that we can use here in the Philippines to provide uh, more cost-effective, more accessible, and affordable tests early diagnosis for dengue patients. Some of the factors that we need to consider for the future of dengue would be things like, one, the evolution of the virus, two, the climate change, and the change it will occur, it will, um, it will cause mosquitoes to behave differently. Factors like globalization, travel, and trade factors, and of course, uh, perennial problems like settlement issues and social economic factors. Uh, we are very concerned by the patterns of dengue recently, where over 100,000 cases have been uh, reported since January of this year, with more than 400 deaths. So we need to really strengthen the control and prevention aspects of dengue. We'd like to encourage all to be involved in the integrated program that Dr. Kachelian uh, pointed out. This is uh, very important in the overall management of dengue infections in our country. We need to push doctors to provide and systems to provide early diagnosis, better care, and appropriate management. We need to get all parents, families, and communities to be into better mosquito control. And of course, we need to be more pharmacovigilant about the current vaccines that have become available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Clara Berba. We now go to our question and answers. We actually have several questions now in our chat box. So the first one is: Do you recommend the Do you recommend the current measure of DepEd of using OL traps as a measure of vector control? So anyone can answer. The OL traps recommended by DepEd. Can you ask them to describe it a little bit? Oh, I will, because I'm not aware. Because remember, I gave you some biological controls, use of copy pods, fish. So what what is the OL traps of the question? Uh, for the person who uh, gave this question, can we ask you to please clarify what the OL traps are? Okay, but, but I think he has left already, so we'll go to the next question. Okay, is it true that the succeeding contractions of dengue hemorrhagic fever of different strains will be more severe than the previous bout? Based on the, the way dengue, the dengue virus affects individuals, there is some... Uh, in the pathophysiology, when you look at um, the response of the human host, your body, to another viral infection, there is some experiences that indeed some cases 
are actually a little bit more complicated than the initial cases. So, um, in many situations, like in many patients, um, they will come in, and when we test them for IgM, IgG, IgG uh, reflects an old infection, they will be very surprised that they had an IgG positive, which implies an old infection. They don't recall being admitted in the past for a previous dengue infection, but that probably means in the past it was a very mild infection, but this time when uh, there's a second infection, he, he needs to come in for hospitalization. So there is some truth to that and experience with that as well, that, that really happens. Okay, there's a follow-up question in that. How about contractions of the same strain repeated? Okay, as we know, there are four types of the dengue virus, types 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that an infection with one type will not protect you or will not give you cross protection against the other serotypes, except for the first six months after the infection where there is a temporary protection. And generally, when you contract one serotype, this will already protect you for life. So generally, and it's very unlikely that we will see uh, an infection with the same serotype because it's supposed to provide you already protection. Um, usually, though, in the clinics, we don't identify the serotypes anymore because that's a very expensive test and uh, it's not really very necessary for routine clinical care. But uh, in surveillance studies, we can try to identify the serotypes. But yes, um, we usually don't get infected with the same serotype. Thank you. Another question is, what is the estimate length of hospital stay? And uh, you mentioned this experience that you got hospitalized for five days with a diagnosis of dengue hemorrhagic fever type 2. If I get another bout of this, approximately how long will my hospital stay be? Of course, I do not hope to have another bout of the disease. Yes, uh, we hope also that you don't get another dengue infection. So, uh, as we said earlier, this is almost like clockwork when we deal with dengue infections, especially in adults. No? Usually, um, the duration of fever is five days, and then when the fever goes away, that's when actually we see a lot of uh, further dramatic drops in your blood counts, and that's why we ask you to stay for another day or so. So if you come in during the first day of fever, then expect that you will be in the hospital, maybe for about seven days. Uh, but we don't recommend having to stay in the hospital for all patients. Most of the time, um, manifestations may be mild and you can continue to uh, hydrate yourself at home. That's what we uh, advise particularly the adults. Adults are sort of easier to manage because you can give them instructions and they can follow. And they, not everybody needs to be at Similarly for children, generally it's about five to seven, at most seven days, but in complicated cases, especially when they come in May, when it's like just one day fever and then the next day they start to get a febrile, and for the next two days that they don't have the fever anymore, they're well, they can usually be discharged. And of course if their platelets are okay, about 100,000, so it's an average of about between three to five days. Thank you. Okay, there's a question on the use of NS1 test. Can the NS1 test return a false negative result on performance within 24 hours of the onset of fever in a case with dengue? The NS1 test is uh, part of the dengue virus, okay? So um, it's best to actually do the NS1 as soon as you have fevers. So it's uh, most sensitive during the first to the third day, maybe up to the fourth day. Um, so the chances of uh, false positive is very low for dengue NS1. It's possible to have a false negative. Thank you. Uh, going back to the OL traps, they, uh, there, there's a follow-up here already. It's an obicidal, larvicidal trap. 
and it's used and uh, developed by the DOS PCHRD. The traps are oval larva traps consisting of black or dark can container with solution from DOST. A lawanit stick is placed inside and the trap is put in dark strategic places and cleaned every three days. So is this helpful? Yeah, I think it's going to be helpful because remember we said that the mosquito actually lives in dark places. So I think that's one of the, the uh, what do you call this, biological terms. They put something, they put an open trap, so I know it's, a, it's the dark, it's uh, like dark na box siya. So, para at least not a trapping mosquito because they prefer to stay in dark places. Okay, and I think there's a solution they uh, mentioned here that there's a special solution from the US. Ah, okay. So, so, so it's It's a live beside them. While we are in the mosquitoes, uh, for those who are watching and the uh, parents or other family members, the mosquito in the house thrives also in dark places. So, they usually fly, they say, only up to the waist part. So uh, you expect cabinets that are sort of dark and damp, you know, kitchen cabinets or even the bathroom area, the garage, the, the gardens, those are where the mosquitoes are. So make sure that when you clean up, you clean these areas and put uh, whatever it takes to remove the mosquitoes from this area. And can I just add to that? At home, when you have this big book, what do they call that? Pick a lalabahan. No, still. Palangkan. <laughs> when you wash them, make sure that you turn them upside down. Because otherwise, there can be some water there and you know the larvae may be uh, there as well. So, dapat yung mga yon, I guess as a final point there. In the bathrooms, sometimes when we leave for like several days, in the toilet, we close or turn down the cover of the toilet bowl. Toilet bowl uh, because uh, while you are away, for example, you are away for a week and nobody's there, then it's possible that mosquitoes uh, start laying eggs in the empty toilet. In fact, there was a study conducted before by Rose Capelli and other colleagues. And they found out that indeed the mosquito larvae can be identified in this toilet. In the, you know, even the base of the toilet, if there's some water there, they have been able to identify the larvae. Mm -hmm. So vector control is really very important. Let me now go to uh, questions and vaccines. What can you say about the statement released by Dr. Dance with regard to dengue immunization causing more severe infection to patients less than 12 years old? Okay, um, I think that in the studies they have shown that children from age 2 to 5 years definitely have a high risk of a safe to sit up. They have a high risk of getting severe dengue when vaccinated. However, in that study, in a postdoc analysis, they have shown that children older than nine years are actually uh, do not have the same risk as that of the younger kids two to five years old. And if you look at the data, for example, if you look at the um, uh, IBMC data, for example, like the 11 out of the, because they were, they were referring as well to that uh, adverse event of 11 cases out of 6,000 plus cases developing severe dengue among those vaccinated and only one out of 3,000 cases vaccinated. Of course, it's a one is to two randomization, so parang galaway on, but anyway, so let's say one out of 3,000. If you try to investigate the 11 cases, eight of those cases were actually in children less than nine years of age. So I think, I believe that if there were really harm and there is an independent data monitoring committee that actually oversees all the adverse events and all the side effects of the vaccine, if indeed there was really harm for those children older than nine, then probably the vaccine, they would have in fact stopped the clinical trial at that point already. So I think that actually it depends because in the targeted population by the government and even by the SAGE and WHO, they say that you can actually implement the national immunization program if for children nine years and older, if your population 
population or if the incidence or the seroprevalence in that particular age group is high. And in the Philippines, with the limited data that we have, the seroprevalence is almost about 89%. Thank you. How do you give the vaccine in your practice? Do you test for uh, dengue prior to infection? What advice do you give patients or parents? Uh, personally, I do not test for um, serology because if I do test, then I will have to give the patient information that because he's seronegative, then I will not administer the vaccine. But of course, that puts the patient at 100% risk of getting the uh, infection. So if ever the patient would request, then the patient will have to know that if because he is seronegative, then we will not administer the vaccine and the patient chooses so even if after informing him that there's always the risk that you will of course develop vaccine anytime. And this means as well that once he gets dengue, that's the only time I can administer the vaccine when the patient gets seropositive, right? For patients that you don't that you don't vaccinate. So in the clinic, actually, I don't do serologic testing for the uh, patients. And so far, the patients, I don't know if they were seronegative or some of them were probably seropositive. Because remember, majority of dengue cases are actually asymptomatic. Remember you were saying earlier, because most of them, it's just a simple trancaso, flu-like symptom. So most of them will not know that they actually had dengue. So personally, I'm uh, doing serologic testing, and I just administer the of course, I need to inform the patients of the possible risk, etc. Just like all other vaccines, when we administer vaccines, you need to dengue, but all other vaccines, you need to inform the patient of the possible risk, reactions, adverse reactions that they may actually encounter. Okay, mm -hmm. parallel to that, uh, you want to answer? Yes. Well, my my patient population is not very into dengue. Understand? <laughs> I work with adult patients and well, and HIV clinic, so. Yeah. We're not into uh, maybe vaccinations for that particular group of patients because remember, uh, there are contraindications to um, dengue vaccination, so uh, it's not recommended for travelers. For example, you're going to visit the Philippines. No, so that's it's a travel not, vaccine. It's not the travel part of the travel vaccination series. And then for those who are immunocompromised for whatever reason, mm -hmm. whether uh, on steroids or um, with HIV infections or undergoing some chemotherapy, these are our own contraindications. So the contraindications, I'm sorry, Nina, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm finished. <laughs> so uh, as far as the contraindications for dengue vaccination is concerned, it's similar to all other live attenuated vaccines. So pareho lang for those who are immunocompromised, patients who are in immunosuppressive therapy, pregnancy, right. breastfeeding are also contraindications for vaccination. I think I failed to mention that as far as the currently available vaccine is concerned, the age of indication is only from 9 to 45 years of age. So you should not administer the vaccine to those younger than 9 or to those older than 45 years. So it's three doses, six month interval. Okay, you mentioned already that you don't do serotype tests before you give the vaccine, but is there a risk for worsening dengue infection occurring in those who were previously seronegative? In the studies, they have shown that amongst the seropositive patients who were vaccinated, those who had antibodies prior to immunization, the immunogenicity was higher compared to those who were seronegative, patients who did not have antibodies prior to immunization. This uh, immunogenicity was like 80% plus for those who were seropositive and about 52% for those who were seronegative. Okay? First of all, we should know that no vaccine is completely safe nor completely effective. So the vaccine generally for those younger than nine, especially the, the two to five years old, definitely can be pregnant because the studies have shown, particularly on the first year follow-up after the completion of the primary series, they have noted an increased risk of about five, seven times in fact for the two to five years old. Okay, and for those less than less than uh, those older than five, for example, the nine years older than five years old up to adolescent. The risk was like five times, but this actually went down to only 1.4%, the relative risk, on the second year of follow-up. So this was year four of the study. And of course, uh, the patient can still have the possibility that this patient will actually develop dengue and may in fact have severe dengue as well. But the risk compared to those two to five years of age is much less than what you would see. 
So all other vaccines, meron na meron din naman talaga side effect niya. But all you need to do is explain to your patient that, of course, I'm giving this vaccine, that there's always a risk, this is not 100% protective, nor is it 100% effective, uh, effective, so that there's a possibility that this patient may develop dengue, it may be a severe form of dengue. Apparently, the same definition of severe dengue was different. In that study, when you HF1, or dengue hemorrhagic fever 1, these were patients presenting fever and positive to the test. The HF2, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever uh, stage 2, kapag ganun ang stage 3, they take their statistics, but not shock. In most of the cases that they defined as severe dengue were actually this patient. So there was, I think there were only two cases in that study that actually had circulatory collapse. But most of the patients, whether in the vaccine group or in the control group, uh, did not, none of the patients actually died. There were no deaths in the, in the even in, in those who were hospitalized. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You already mentioned that the age indication for the vaccine is between 9 to 45 years old. The question here is, what about uh, vaccine recommendation for adults? So I guess this one is for uh, greater than 45 years old. Um, the label or for the indication for which the vaccine is licensed is only up to 45 years of age. So. I do not recommend administering the vaccine to those older than 45, nor to patients younger than 9 years old. Right. So actually, it's the experience from the trials that uh, uh, were the drivers for why the age uh, recommendations are as follows. And so it's because of the results of the trials. Thank you. There's a question here on whether you approve of a specific food preference allegedly to increase platelet count of patients with dengue. Uh, the example here given is durian, papaya, the, uh, the fruit and the leaves. So any comment on that? Well, actually, what uh, what's sort of popular among, uh, among us <laughs> is the yes. herb called the tawa-tawa or the euphorbia hirta which actually was uh, investigated by a group from the University of San Tomas in 2012. And actually, this group won the Grupo Medica Award because they were able to show in an animal model that perhaps from that point on, they showed lower bleeding, promoted platelet homeostatic function, and increased platelet count. But then, at this point, it's not yet recommended as part of the general standard of care for management of dengue because um, this is an animal model and we need to translate that to human experience. Related to um, other foods, there's really no restrictions. I do not give any restriction. In fact, if patients start to eat because when they come in very sick in the start of their illness, they usually don't have any appetite. So when their appetite start to come back, when the flavors yeah, go down. We encourage them to eat anything, no restrictions. Okay, can I just say something about the samatawa and all this? Like you were saying, the durian leaves. Probably because what they do is they 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 crush the leaves, mm -hmm. make it into like a tea or something. So I think it's probably more related to hydration, just like tawa tawa. Di ba pa niya? Kina crush nila. And they break the liquid. Kina kapuwa kasi So I think it's more related to the hydration, which is the basic uh, management for dengue. Okay, this one is for Dr. Gatchalian. What is the position of the PPS fits B regarding dengue immunization? Actually, I failed to put that because I didn't want to put a lot of things about the vaccine. Uh, the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines, together with the Philippine Pediatric Society, actually recommend the uh, dengue vaccination for children 9 to 45 for children. Uh, nine and to the age education of the adult of 45 years of age. And in that uh, recommendation as well, uh, we recommend that uh, you avoid co-administration, although WHO and the SAGE were very permissive as far as co-administration is concerned. But in the PTSP opposition statement, we try not to have co-administration administered because at this time, uh, there are not enough studies to document this. And uh, we, uh, I recommend as well that the vaccine be given for three doses at six months in general. So if you want to look at the whole paper, um, it is published in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Society of the Philippines and in the PPS in the area where it says archive. 
you can go into there and you can read the whole position paper. So there's no recommendation for future boosters right now? No, we're not because up to now the study has not shown whether you would need a booster or not. So for now, we're not recommending any booster because there are no studies to say so or to document and to give the data. So in that recommendation, we only recommend the three doses of the vaccine. Thank you. Another question is, is ibuprofen contraindicated for fever in dengue patients? I think even WHO says so. That, you know, uh, ibuprofen or the NSAIDs are actually not recommended because of the risk of gastrointestinal bleeding. And, you know, this, this might confuse the physician, the parents, the family, oh, there's bleeding, when actually it's because of the medication. That's why the recommendation is really paracetamol or acetaminophen. Okay, so we still have uh, several questions. So this one is from what the main speaker presented a while ago. I am under the impression that a mosquito vector can possess more than one type of strain at one instance. So if this is the case, can a person be infected with two different strains in uh, one instance? And what is the prognosis for this patient? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, that there can be simultra uh, simultaneous transmission of more, more than one serotype. However, there's very limited data and there's really no conclusive data to say that the patient will actually develop a, a more severe form of dengue. Okay? The thing is, there will only be one serotype that will actually have clinical manifestation. And like I said, we don't know if because of the simultaneous transmission or the concurrent presence of two serotypes to make the disease more severe is still unknown. Thank you. And we have one more. So, uh, does peripheral smear have significance in detection of dengue virus or chikungunya or Zika virus for that matter? Mm, I, I guess it will just show you the low yeah. Yeah. and the platelets. Yeah. In, in actually, initially, when you, for example, for the first two days and you come in for CBC or peripheral smear, you would only see normal picture. So it's only starting maybe at the third to the fifth day that there are changes that will make you suspect that this is a viral infection problem. So when the WBC starts to go down, there's a trend of your feet that will so the peripheral smear will not in any way tell you whether this is dengue. Even if there are changes, it will not tell you that it's dengue or Zika or Chikungunya. It's more of a clinical Let's see anything in the peripheral yeah. smear is yeah. at the blood cells. Yes. Right. But the CBC may be important because it will guide the physician whether he might want to watch you more closely mm -hmm. in a hospital setting that will send you home. But not to tell you it's Zika or Chikungunya <laughs> or dengue. Well, more or less because now the most common one that we see is actually dengue. But we need to be vigilant as well because now we're seeing a lot of we're seeing, not a lot, but we're seeing Zika um, cases too. Thank you. Thank you for that engaging discussion, Dr. Gatchelian and Dr. Verba. To summarize, we've learned that dengue is, uh, the prevalence of dengue is increasing. The burden of dengue is higher than other infectious diseases, like you mentioned, the respiratory infections. Dengue is a viral disease with a sensitivity as the insect vector, and individuals can be co-infected with more than one serotype, uh, and also with chikungunya and Zika. Dengue infection results in a spectrum of disease with fever as the most common initial uh, presentation, and then you have for diagnosis either detection of viral antigens in the four, first four days of the fever. And then you have your indirect methods like your antibody detection using serologic methods. And prevention is very important in dengue. You presented vector control, which involves environmental management, chemical control, and biological control. And lastly, an integrated strategy of both vector control and vaccination is ideal for dengue prevention. Although there's uh, <laughs> always the risk with the vaccine. It's not 100% safe. After this session, an email containing a survey link will be sent to you. After answering the survey, your certificates will be sent to you. 
Please answer the survey so we can assess our webinar and address more of your preferences and give you materials from this session. You can actually access the slides at uh, facebook.com slash webinars. There are webinar recordings there posted. Okay, we also want to thank our sponsor, Sanofi Pasteur, and the Philippine Daily Inquirer, the Filipino Doctor, for their support as our media partners. We hope to see you again in our upcoming webinar on October 26th, that's a Wednesday at 12 to 1 p.m. Manila time. With uh, speaker Dr. Irma Makalinao and Dr. Oscar Kuluganan on environmental toxins and the developing child. Please invite your colleagues to join this continuing monthly CME webinar series. All webinar schedules and resources will be posted at the flash on the screen. You may also subscribe to our mailing list at this website. You may also email us at upmedwebinars2016 at gmail.com for any inquiries. On behalf of the UPCM Plus 1991 and the UP Medical Alumni Society, we also thank our collaborator units, UP Manila Information Management. National Early Health Center, UP College of Medicine Postgrad Institute of Medicine and Medical Informatics Unit, BOSTASTI, and Ms. Therese Orhalo, the UP Manila National Telehealth, our host. And in behalf of Class 91, together with Dr. Tina Eviota Hizon, our most esteemed speakers, Dr. Salvation Gatchalian and Dr. Nina Berba. And the UP Med webinar team, this is Dr. Mary Ann Castor, closing this session. We have hope to have we have learned a lot from this webinar. Join us again on October 26th. Have a great week ahead. I don't know if I'm going to cover it. I really? Because I'm going to discuss it. I'm going to discuss it. I'm going to discuss it.